Well, good morning. Good morning and welcome. Let's go ahead and make our way towards our seats. A lot of good energy in here this morning. Come on, Frank. Good morning. It's good to see everybody this morning. Good morning. Uh, welcome to Branch of Hope. My name is Daniel Parkins, and uh, this is my name tag, in case you guys uh, get confused. I have a name tag on, we all do, uh, who are serving here. We want to uh, thank Sarah and Lisa for the, the brains behind our welcoming. Hopefully you guys uh, felt welcomed as you came in. If this is your first time, um, I'll be the third or fourth or fifth person to say welcome. Uh, we are excited to have you here with us, everybody, uh, and uh, I have a few announcements to make before we begin our service. Um, so with that, we always kind of have some specific areas in which we are asking people to serve. Uh, one of the things that we want to encourage everybody who's a member here uh, to, to consider serving the church in some capacity uh, and using your gifts. We know that our church is stronger because you are here. And so one of the areas that we're doing that first is, uh, or just this morning is we're announcing that we need help in their youth group. Uh, so youth group is seeking energetic and passionate youth leaders. Uh, if you're interested in serving the youth weekly on Monday nights, um, we would love to have you. Please contact Mike Doobie for that. His email is youth at branchofhope.org. Not, not too hard to remember, so just youth at branchofhope.org. We have some upcoming events. The first one is that we have today our deacon meeting. Uh, so if you have needs, if you'd like to seek out the deacons, I think that they would prefer if you'd seek them out beforehand so they could put that on the agenda. Uh, but uh, if this is an emergency, please contact them. Also, we have our Beacon Light meals today. You will be returning your frozen meals, and uh, Kelly will be picking those up uh, this afternoon. Uh, so we'll be handing those in. Also, uh, in case you guys were wondering, we have uh, in the past done prayer before Branch of Hope. So we invite anybody who wants to come and pray for the service and the needs of our congregation specifically uh, at 9.30, uh, and they meet in the, uh, I believe that's the nursery room, not the nursery room, but the, uh, the tra counseling room, no, one of the rooms back there uh, at the end of the hallway, I'm not sure, what, it's got a, a window on the door, um, but it's always open, please come and join us, it's very obvious at, at 9.30 uh, on Sunday mornings. Also, this Wednesday, we're going to continue our beach days at uh, Sapphire, uh, where everybody is welcome in Redondo Beach. We want to encourage you to come. Please contact Lisa. That'll be on the 28th. Uh, that's this Wednesday. So contact Lisa at office at branchofhope.org. We have our youth group summer kickoff. That's going to be happening on the 26th, which is tomorrow night at the Doobie Residence. Uh, if you have questions on that, again, you can just contact youth at branchofhope.org, and Mike will get back to you. Um, and that'll be from 6 to 9 p.m. We are having a special event where we're going to be watching the sunset on Friday night at Knob Hill. And uh, we encourage you to bring a volleyball and your dinner. And everyone is welcome. I do want to make sure that everybody knows that everybody is welcome. So we'd love to see as many people there playing volleyball. Uh, this isn't just for kids, per se, although kids are welcome to come. Uh, but we want to encourage those who say, you know what, I want to get involved with my church family. I want to hang out with some people. We'd love to see you on a Friday night, and that will be at Knob Hill where the, uh, the volleyball cart courts are. Uh, also, this Saturday, uh, next week, on Saturday, we are having our memorial service for Dennis Nielsen. That will be at 1 p.m. here at Branch, so we encourage anybody who knew Dennis to celebrate his life with us at 1 p.m. Uh, we have our Corks and Forks Women's Fellowship. You can see all these wonderful announcements made by, by Sarah. Um, we are having our Corks and Forks on the 4th of August from 5 to 9 p.m. at the home of Michelle Gregg. Michelle and Mike Gregg, Mike being one of the elders here, we uh, encourage you to go. If you have any questions on that, this is for a, a woman's fellowship. And, um, yeah, excited. We also do want to say that this, uh, the August men's breakfast is canceled for uh, this August because of uh, vacations and just tons of things happening, uh, but they hope to resume that in September. And the last thing is we are going to be having our barbecue and fellowship meal, which will be the first Sunday, or I guess it would be the second Sunday, uh, the 8th of August. So we encourage you guys to bring a side dish to that and make plans that will be immediately following our church 
Q&A time uh, after the service. So with that, we will begin. Thank you, Dan. Unlike Dan, I don't have my name tag. I have to see if, see if it's out there or something. Um, this, uh, this morning's call to worship is taken from Psalm 73, verses 25 through 28. And uh, let's just settle our hearts and minds and uh, think about the one we've come to worship, okay? Psalm 73, hear now the word of God. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none upon earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For indeed, those who are far off from you shall perish. You have destroyed all those who, who desert you for harlotry. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God, that I may declare all your works. Thus far, the reading of God's word. Join me in prayer, please. Father in heaven, it is good for us to draw near to you. Lord, we have put our trust in you. And to whom else shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. You have chosen us before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before you in love. You have predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of your will. We are your workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which you have prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. But have we so walked? We confess that we have fallen short. We confess that we have not done all to resist the world, the flesh, and the devil. We come before you now silently to confess our sin and transgressions to you. We thank you, Father, that we who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. We thank you that when we sin, you have provided us with an advocate, Jesus Christ the righteous. We thank you for keeping your promises. We ask now that you would bless the remainder of this worship service as we have come to worship you. It is in Christ's name we pray, amen. So uh, the words of pardon I've chosen or are taken from Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, uh, old familiar, uh, but it, I mean, they are so pertinent. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. So family of God, do you believe God's word? If so, it is my pleasure to assure you of what the scriptures plainly teach, that your sins are washed away.
Good morning. This morning's congregational reading will be from the Heidelberg Catechism. We are continuing our reading of it. Today we will be going over questions 101 and 102. I will read the questions and we will all answer. But may we swear an oath by the name of God in a godly manner? Yes, when the government demands it of its subjects or when necessity requires it in order to maintain and promote fidelity and truth to God's glory and for our neighbor's good. Such rule taking is based on God's word and was therefore rightly used by saints in the Old and New Testament. Question 102. May we also swear by saints or other creatures? No. A lawful oath is calling upon God, who alone knows heart, to bear witness to the truth and to punish me if I swear falsely. No creature is worthy of such honor. Let's pray. Our glorious Father, we just thank you so much that we once again get to gather here on this Lord's Day to worship as a corporate body. And we just thank you so much that by no work of our own, you have blessed us so tremendously, both with our salvation through your Son, our, cho our choosing by you to be one of yours, and even just the material blessings that you've given us in this life. We have so much to be thankful for as we gather here today, and we know deep down inside that whatever we get it is completely undeserved. We now come before you to pray for the tithes and offerings that we are giving, and we thank you so much that it is our joy to be able to give part of that which you have given us to continue your kingdom here on earth. We pray for the elders and the deacons as they oversee these funds and continue to give us the knowledge and strength to know how to use these funds to best further your kingdom here. And we pray for those who are going to be receiving it, and may it reach them and bless them. We pray all these things in your son's holy name. Amen. So this is the time in our service where we pray for the needs of our body. So I'll pray and you, you could join me. And then um, at the end of this, we'll all recite the Lord's Prayer. Okay. Father in heaven, we pray for the overall health and well-being of our members and their families. We specifically pray for the pregnancies of Sarah Tavern, Miranda Braden, Avery Doobie, and Shannon Trimper. Please bless and sanctify these unborn children. For those suffering from dementia and Alzheimer's, we ask for safety, peace, and comfort. We pray this for Monica, Beth, Susanna, Mimika, Rosie, Carolyn, Donald, and Fred. We ask for wisdom and a special blessing for their families and caregivers as they minister to these individuals. We now lift up to you those battling cancer and ask for your peace, healing, and comfort. For Chris, Elva, Julie, Kalea, Betty, Gloria, Arnulfel, Andrea, Karen, Luann, Lindy, Rex, and Tiffany, we ask for a full recovery. For their families and caregivers, we ask that they not be weary in well-doing as they minister to those who are hurting. Speaking of those who are hurting, Lord, we ask for relief from fatigue and other ailments for Kenny Valdir, and that you would stop the encephalopathy from further spreading in his brain. We pray for comfort for Al Metz, who remains under palliative care. Also, Bridget Morrow has a surgery date for her second hip replacement. We pray that her pain would be manageable in the meantime. 
And last, we pray for Angela, Andrea Lucero's sister, who is in the hospital with an abscess in her abdomen. May the doctors properly diagnose and treat her condition. Father in heaven, you know our needs even before we ask. Therefore, in this manner we pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Morning. We are in part 10 of our series going through the Revelation. Today we'll be uh, addressing Jesus' letter to the church at Smyrna. And just to remind you before I read, you know, these, uh, these uh, four verses, that the theme is, that we see in the Revelation is the victory, over, uh, the victory of Christ over all evil, over all oppression. And so as we look at these uh, seven letters to seven churches, which really 
uh, amounts to part two of the outline of Revelation. Part one of the outline is chapter one. Part two of the outline is chapters two and three. And then really four through 18 is uh, part three. What we're going to see here is that Jesus is exhorting churches to remain churches. That ultimately, even as we saw, sung in the song, that the, the, the church is being built and the righteousness of God will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. But what's important is that churches remain churches. And we're going to see that theme throughout these seven letters to these seven churches because they're being tempted to move in a wayward direction. And we're going to see uh, something quite unique this morning as we look at uh, Smyrna. There's something about Smyrna that is unlike the other seven churches or the other six churches. So Revelation 2, verses 8 through 11, here now, the Word of God. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. I know your works, tribulation, and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Thus far, the reading of God's word. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we do pray that even as we sang, that you would sanctify our hearts and our minds. Help us to be transformed by the renewing thereof. And we do pray that in all of this, that your name would be lifted up and your glory would prevail. What a wonderful thing. What a wonderful promise you've given to us that you will overcome sin and death and goodness, and your light will reign upon the earth all the way into glory, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I wasn't raised, as many of you know, in the church, and I actually have a pretty clear recollection of my assessment of Christians back in the 60s and 70s. To me, they seemed a bit antiseptic and to use the term that we used to use back in the 60s, square. And the ones, you know, who refused to participate in our shenanigans, at least I viewed them as a bit holier than thou, little self-righteous. Well, in contemplating coming to faith, because I remember wrestling through this as a teenager, one of my early concerns, and I, think, I don't want to call it a fear because that seems like too strong of a, a word, was that I might not be considered cool or hip. I'm like, this community just doesn't seem all that hip to me. And now I'm going to be part of this uncool culture. And, and the prospect of being accused of being self-righteous or judgmental, like entering a group of people who are routinely accused of being judgmental and self-righteous was very off-putting to me. I, these are the things I wrestled with before I came to faith. That and whether or not God would send me to a foreign country. I, you know me, I don't want to go east of PCH. And I'm thinking, where is he going to send me if I go down this road? Nonetheless, the Holy Spirit had his way with me and the, the effective call of God changed my heart, and God brought me near uh, by His grace. But as I, as I now peruse the, the current cultural environment, I get the vivid impression that being accused of being antiseptic or square or uncool or self-righteous or judgmental Although they're still on the list, and I think they will always be on the list of people, people's misgivings, I don't think those things are any longer on the top of the list in terms of what young people especially 
have to grapple with in terms of the, what's, being hap- what's happening to dissuade them from coming to faith. I think there are new adjectives that are riding shotgun on the stagecoach of the enemy's efforts to keep people away from the Christian faith. Last week we talked a little bit about the accusation of being hateful and bigoted. It's kind of a routine in terms of uh, the accusations against Christians. But I think we can add to that. I think we are now in a place where if you present a Christian life and worldview, if you begin to present Christian ethics, you will be accused of being outright evil. The ethics now are evil. That which Christians think is right has now become, in this world, a dark enterprise. Let me give you an example. In a mere half generation, we have evolved from what actually constitutes legitimate amorous or um, sexual desire. Just a half a generation ago, the argument was, why do you care about what I do in the confines of my own bedroom? That was the argument. Why do you care about that? But that is no longer the argument. The the new argument is, if you don't publicly endorse and sanction my passionate proclivities and allow your children to be catechized thusly, you are an evil person and you should be ostracized from public discourse. It's not just now what I do in the privacy of my own bedroom. We want a parade and we want to require that it be in the curriculum of your five-year-olds. That's where we've gone in a half a generation. It may very well, in this generation coming up, become illegal, even in the pulpit, to teach that intimacy should be confined to marriage and that marriage should be between a biological male and a biological female. I never thought that that would be such a cutting-edge thing to say. I never thought I may get in trouble for saying that. But that's, that is what our young people are contending with. That's the world that we've left them in terms of the kind of way we've approached the kingdom of God in this generation. Now, I, I open with this for a couple of reasons. Because here's kind of what, the way I operate, you know, when I study a passage. And I look at that passage And I feel like, all right, I think I have a grasp of it. And then I ask myself, what jumps out at me in terms of what this passage is teaching in relationship to the world that we're now living in? So I I mentioned this for a couple of reasons. One is, I want us, especially those of us who are a little bit older, to be sensitive to the challenges facing our young people. They're in a different world than we are in. I mean, it's... Don't get me wrong, it's facing us as well, but they are bombarded with this thinking. Now, you've already heard in this church a couple of times references to predestination and election and whatever term you like to use it, you know, the doctrines of grace. And you may think, well, if you believe in election and predestination, why are you so concerned about, you know, the, the cultural environment and the sins by which we're surrounded? You, should, you might think, you know what, cultural pressures simply don't matter. But a Jesus wouldn't agree. Jesus seemed to indicate, as a matter of fact, a lot of scripture indicates that, that riches, for example, are highly dissuasive in terms of bringing somebody to faith. That, that an undue love affair with the world, whether you love the world or the world loves you, these are things that kind of enter our psyche that the enemy uses to keep us from embracing the Christian faith. So so even though we most assuredly recognize that apart from grace, it is impossible to use the words of Jesus to come to faith. It's impossible in the nature of man. There are things in this world, the world, the flesh, the devil, that make war with the kingdom of God. Well, we have to recognize that 
this general love of the world can be a formidable and dissuasive enemy when it comes to walking by faith. We can't put our heads in the sand. We need to recognize the world in which we live and how it is affecting not only the way we think, but affecting those who are potential category, uh, converts. And you might say, well, I'm glad I'm not rich, but let me just tell you this. You know, when Jesus says it's easier for a camel to go through it, the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter in the kingdom of God. By, by historic standards and by cultural standards, everybody probably listening to my voice would be in the category of rich. That, that, that is just where we are, unless this gets broadcast you know, in, in India or into China. Everybody who's listening to this, you're in the, you are in the wealthy category. Most of us live put it this way, in a world that's quite nice to us. The other reason I bring this up to begin with is the do not fear category um, in this passage. Now, the do not fear that Jesus brings up is likely referring to martyrdom. Do not fear what's about to happen to you. But let me just tell you this, that if you're not willing, if you're not willing to be faithful to a lesser threat, don't, don't think or fantasize that you're going to be willing to be faithful to a greater threat. Don't go, you know, I, I'm going to give in to these little things that are tempting me, but if the big thing comes, I'm going to stand my ground. That is not the way it works. There's a biblical principle that teaches us that if we're not faithful in the small, we won't be faithful in the big. So we need to recognize that even though I don't have the message to you right now that you're about to be thrown into prison, I don't have the message to you right now that you may be put to death, and I'm not going to say be faithful unto death when the death comes, because you're probably all, like me, going to die of having too fatty of a diet or something like that. You're not going to... Nonetheless, we need to recognize that we are called to faithfulness. That's what Jesus is saying here. He's, he's, he is calling these people to be faithful. Now, what we're going to see in this letter to Smyrna, and is, a, is an example. And it is the one example, the only example of these seven churches of a faithful church. Yeah, there's, a, there's a pattern in these seven letters where you, know, you see the title of Christ and you see him saying, I know something about you. And then there's usually some critique of something they're doing wrong. That's not happening with Smyrna. Everything in Smyrna is positive. Smyrna is a faithful church, yet know this, that does not exempt them from the difficulties that lie ahead. They are a faithful church, but they're about to enter into difficult times. Now let's talk a little bit about Smyrna itself. Smyrna is about somewhere between 35 to 50 miles north of Ephesus. Remember, last, year, last week we started with Ephesus. Where, where the, these letters, these seven letters, seven churches, are on a Roman postal route. So it starts with Ephesus, and then it starts kind of doing like a horseshoe. So we're, now we're going north. And Smyrna was known as a very beautiful city. It was actually called the Lovely Crown, the Ornament of Asia. So we're talking about a place that if you, you might go there on vacation because it's so nice. Actually... It was very rich. They had a lot of trade that took place there. But interestingly enough, in 580 BC, before Christ, that city was leveled to the ground. It was leveled to nothing and then rebuilt in 290 BC. So we've got a, a couple of hundred years here. And it was one of the first and only actual planned cities. It, they didn't they kind of said, okay, what are we going to do here? If you've ever been to a planned city, you know, you can see that things are pretty well organized. And they were actually known for having streets of gold. Now, I tried to do a little research and go, well, was it real gold or was it gold plated or was it painted gold? I don't have an answer to that question. But that's kind of the city. It was like this beautiful city with streets of gold. But in 195 B.C., now this is before the Roman Empire, this is still during the time when the Greeks more or less ruled the world, they erected 
there a temple to the goddess of Rome. They actually had to win that honor. That was something, you know, it was like winning the, you know, a place to have the Olympics, right? You had to compete for it and get the honor of erecting a temple to the goddess of Rome. And I mention that because Smyrna was a hub of emperor worship. And I think it's important for us to recognize this. Um, the, the, the Caesars required that the citizens acknowledge their deity, that they, were, they weren't just leaders, they weren't just civil magistrates, they had a level of godhood that the citizens needed to acknowledge. They actually built a temple to Tiberius, who was the Caesar in Rome from 14 to 37 AD. So they're going, we're going to, we, we're going to, we, we are on board to worship Caesar. They also had athletic games there. Smyrna was also famous for a colony of Jews who, very similar to the Pharisees, were very hostile to Christians. That's probably the reference here to the synagogue of Satan. We'll get to that in a second. They say they are Jews, but they're not. But they are a synagogue of Satan. All of these things we find in the city of Smyrna. That's the kind of city that we see Jesus riding to. Now, one other thing that we know from history about Smyrna. Polycarp. You don't see him in the Bible. Polycarp was a student of the Apostle John one of the uh, last living students of the Apostle John who wrote the Revelation. And Polycarp was the bishop at Smyrna. So he was the Christian there. He was the religious head of Smyrna. Now, in 155, Polycarp was 86 years old, and he was arrested for his faith. Now, the proconsul, the, the Roman authorities, they threatened him. You know, they had to find him, then they threatened him. We're going to tear you apart with wild beasts unless you deny Christ and, pin and just pinch a little incense to Caesar. Matter of fact, if you get into the whole story, and we don't have time to get to the whole story here, it was almost as if, you know, the authority figures, they kind of liked him. He, he was a well-liked person. And they're like, going, look at all you have to do is a little incense. Pinch a little incense and just say, Caesar is Lord. You know, we're common, we commonly say, Jesus is Lord. I don't think we recognize that the phrase, Jesus is Lord, was a response to Caesar is Lord. You got to make a decision. Do you have, who's your king? King, we have no king but Caesar, we read in the Gospels. Or is Christ your Lord? That is what Polycarp is being hit with. And they're basically saying, if you don't do this, we're going to throw you in there, and wild animals are going to eat you. We have actually the words, because this was very public of Polycarp. This was his response. Four score and six years, so he's 86 years old. Four score and six years I have served him, and he has never done me injury. How then can I now blaspheme my king and savior? This is a brother in Christ. And I think it's worth recognizing. So the, apparently the wild beast threat wasn't working, so now they threaten to burn him. Matter of fact, the, it's very likely that the, those who are part of the synagogue of Satan, those who say they are Jews but are not, were the ones kind of behind this. And historically, we are taught that they actually, on the Sabbath, gathered wood, which they weren't supposed to do, just to burn Polycarp. That's how into it they were. Well, they're about to burn him, and then we have another speech recorded. Polycarp makes this statement when, they, when they're like, going, okay, we're go you're going to get burned. And he said, you threaten me with fire which burns for an hour, and after a little while is extinguished, but are ignorant of the coming fire that is reserved for the ungodly. So why do you delay? Do whatever you will. And he was burned, and he was refused an honorable burial in hopes of sending a message to the church. But it did not actually accomplish its desired effect. We're still talking about Polycarp, right? The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. 
Okay, moving on. Verse 8. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. Again, just to review, the word angel here is probably referring to the pastor of the congregation who is giving the message to the congregation. And then we have the title, first and last, dead and came to life. I don't want to put too much into that. We're not told exactly why a specific title is given to a specific church in terms of the address of Jesus. Some people have speculated that it had to do with what was happening in Smyrna itself. Smyrna, in a sense, as a city, died and came back to life. Like I said earlier, the whole city was waylaid in 590, 580, and then it was built up and it became a beautiful hub. So maybe some people speculate that it's kind of like it was dead and now it's alive. There was also a fable that was popular at the time, and you may have heard this. You hear this kind of sometimes when people say, well, you know, the story of Jesus dying and coming back to life there were people before him who did that, or they said about that. And, um, you know, not to get into the details there, but, you know, the message of the gospel goes all the way back to the beginning of time. So, of course, there are going to be counterfeits. You're going to hear, well, other religions believed in a flood. Well, of course, other religions believed in the flood. You know why? Because there was a flood. I mean, these types of arguments, they seem like they get gravel, but they really don't. But there was this... Uh, fable that Dionysus was dead and came back to life. And so some people speculated that's like, no, this is the real first and last who was dead and came back to life. Well, I, I don't know for sure, but it seems most reasonable to me as I read this to conclude that since the church was about to undergo such a fiery trial, which may have included the death of many of these people, they are reminded who's in control of human history. First and last, beginning and end. This is a, these are designations that belong to God and to God alone, who is in control of history. And the fact that they were going to be presented with the possibility of dying, they needed to know that say, they served a Savior who was dead and came back to life and gives the victory of that life to all who call upon His name. And we need to ever approach the Revelation, really any book in the Bible, with a recognition of the resurrection. Our minds can't drift as we study the Bible away from the fact that the power of the victory that we're going to see in this entire book is assigned to the resurrection. And that goes to you individually over the sin and death that inevitably waits you or the culture in terms of its effect. It is the power of the resurrection that accomplishes these things. Moving on, verse 9. This is, again, Jesus speaking. I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. So the city, as I said, was rich, but the members of this church were not. That's a conclusion we have to kind of draw here. It was not an easy place to be a Christian. We're going to see later in Revelation that trade unions actually required an allegiance to, to Caesar. You know, I talked about Polycarp. You, had, you pinch a little incense. If you don't do that, if you didn't do that, you could not engage in the trade. Later, we're going to see this more or less in a reference to the mark of the beast. If you don't take the mark, you can't engage in this society in any kind of prosperous way. Their tribulation... Jesus says, I know your tribulation. Well, what does that mean, their tribulation? That they, that they were oppressed, that they were afflicted, that things were hard for them. And their poverty, poverty was just that, literal poverty. They, they just couldn't make ends meet. They didn't have two nickels to rub together. And all of this is very likely due to their faithfulness. The, you know, they, if they wanted to remain faithful, they were not going to ascend to the higher ladder of the society. Apparently, the prosperity gospel had not reached Smyrna. So let me ask you, and I ask myself, what are we willing to sacrifice in order to maintain our faithfulness? Because I'm going to tell you, we've lived in a culture 
where it's um, kind of politically expeditious and beneficial to be a Christian. That's kind of the way it's been in America for a while. You, you want to, like I've said before, you want to run for president, you still got to kind of be a Christian. We've not had a president who has not in some level said, I'm a Christian. But what, when we get to the place where that is no longer required, where it's no longer profitable or beneficial, either financially or socially, are you still willing to be faithful? Are you willing to count the cost? You know, I was talking about, you know, things that were a deterrent to me in coming to faith. You know, the, the Christian faith was presented to me, you know, as an abundant life, you know, from John 10, 10. And I get that. because so I'm going, okay, my life was pretty good. You're saying it could be better. I don't see Jesus presenting the gospel that way. I see him saying things like, I don't have a, a, a rock to lay my head on. You need to die. You need to hate your own life. I mean, he's saying these things where you're kind of going, wow, how do you get any followers at all with that kind of presentation? And yet we need to ever, as, especially as we mature, kind of go, look at I understand more and more what it costs, the cost of discipleship, the cost of following Christ, whether it has to do with income, the convenience of public education, social advancement, creature comforts, and life itself. Are you kind of going, look, and I'm trying to prepare my heart and my mind to be willing to give it all up? Are we willing to remain or even descend to the lower ladder of our culture for our faith? Are we willing, are you willing to be poor in the world's eyes that you might be rich toward God? Now, you know, I mean, you, you, and maybe right now in the back of your mind you're going, yeah, yeah, I can. All right, well, good, good for you. Well, let's just see what happens, right, as life really kind of begins to give you the blows. The author of Hebrews writes in Hebrews 10.34, For you had compassion on me and my chains and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and an enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. You know, you can barely read a few chapters in your Bible without coming across some lesson on the deceptiveness of riches. To what extent do we believe and embrace the estimation of Christ, as we read in this passage, of what actually constitutes riches. Do you, do you have it squarely in your mind what riches actually are? Because Jesus says, I know your poverty, I know your tribulation, but you are rich. What, what's he saying there? That's not, he's not being contradictory. You're poor in one way, but you're rich in another way. And the way you're rich we have to read that, is far superior to the way that you're poor. Well, we read in 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19, As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches. Now, don't get me wrong. I mean, there were a lot, you're going to read a lot of people in the Bible you know, who have money and are godly people. It's not as if being rich is inherently evil. It is a great temptation. And if you start putting faith in riches, you're putting your faith in that which is uncertain, the uncertainty of riches. Because you know, let me tell you, however rich you are right now, you might be poor tomorrow. It's just the way it works. All I have to do is go back you know, less than a century, and everybody who was rich in 1928 was not rich in 1929. So you and we, we forget it was, you know, the beginning of the Depression, for those of you who are not old enough to remember. <laughs> Going on with the passage, <clears throat> but on God who richly provides us with every, everything to enjoy. So this, it's not a call uh, to be ascetic or monastic. God has given us things to enjoy. Right? I mean, it's not you're, you, you, you don't want to become kind of like the Desert Fathers who go, well, I've got to whip myself in order to be sanctified. You just need to be faithful. And if the whipping comes, so be it. But you don't whip yourself. God has given us things to enjoy, and when He gives us something to enjoy, we should enjoy it. They are to do good. And if you want to be rich, we have the definition here. 
be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasures for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. That's true life. He's kind of giving us a definition. When Jesus says, I know your poverty, I know your tribulation, but you're rich, he's saying, in terms of what really constitutes true life, you have it. Then he talks about this blasphemy. And for those of you who don't know what blasphemy means, it's a reviling accusation. That's what blasphemy means. Oftentimes in the Bible, it's kind of aimed toward God. Here, it's probably aimed toward that church. Jesus is saying, I know that they are blaspheming you. They're reviling you. They're falsely accusing you. I mean, going back to Polycarp, he was falsely accused. They brought, same as with Jesus, they brought in false witnesses to testify against him. This is why I brought this up in our introduction, because we live in a culture where young people are going to be accused. They're going to be reviled. They're going to be blasphemed because they think in terms of biblical ethics. Don't expect accolades from the world when they discover you're a follower of Christ. If they come, great, but don't expect them. Jesus made that very clear. And he, he said, you know what, if they hate me, they're going to hate you. No, no servant is greater than his master. You, you need to at least have that. We, again, we're not hunting for that, but we need to be willing to endure it for Christ's sake. Jesus also knows who the antagonists are in this picture. And the antagonists are religious. Now, let me just say, Anybody who's cracked a book, and I can't believe how quickly we have forgotten this, anybody who's cracked a history book knows that the 20th century is replete with the horror and tragedy of communist slash atheist leaders ruling in such a way as to put tens of millions of innocent people to death because they would not bow the knee to Christ. People are like, my atheist friends are like, well, as atheists, we don't, we don't believe anything, so you can't say that we have this view. I'm like, no, 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 the problem is what you refuse to do. It's what you refuse to believe. And the fact that you refuse to bow the knee to Christ results in the fact that people like Stalin and Lenin and Mao, in this, just in one century, led a bloodbath of innocent people, even of their own citizens. So we see this historically. But I will tell you this, if you go back in history and if you read your Bible, the most soul-damning enterprise we read of in the scriptures comes from religious people. The greatest enemy of Jesus were priests. So we need to recognize that it is bad religion, that we need to have our antennas up. The devil doesn't pose as an atheist, does he? He poses as an angel. And not just an angel, but an angel of what? of light. He doesn't pose as a dark angel. He poses as a righteous angel. Now this will come more to the fore as we go through the revelation. But now we have to recognize this. And we read it here in verse 9 and then it's in Revelation 3, 9. There are those who say they are Jews, but they're not. That's what Jesus says. Those who say they are Jews, but they are not. So what we're talking about here, who are we talking about here? What we're talking about are ethnic Jews. The Apostle Paul called them his countrymen according to the flesh. That, and, people, and these were people he loved, right? I mean, he was like, I, I would be accursed that my fellow countrymen according to the flesh would come to faith. I mean, he had a passion for his lost brethren according to the flesh. Not according to the spirit, but according to the flesh. That's who we're talking about here. Now, I'm going to make a very, very long story, very, very brief here. And if you're interested, you can look at my sermons in Romans 9 through 11. The Apostle Paul in Romans 9 through 11 will teach that the Jews, the ethnic Jews, are not entirely removed from the equation of redemption. We have to recognize that. It's not as if those Jews who crucified Christ, ended up like Sodom and Gomorrah. They weren't wiped off the face of the earth. They weren't like the Amorites who just, God, every man, woman, child, animal, 
That is not what happened to the Jews. Matter of fact, what you are going to discover if you read, I think, Romans 9, 10, and 11 correctly is that there will be a great conversion of, of Jews. That's what Paul's kind of teaching there, that it's going to be like a resurrection from the dead. People, these Jews are going to come to faith in Christ. And amen to that. Amen, amen that that will take place. But what we should never do, and, I, and this, by the way, is the popular position today, what we should never do is teach that apart from Christ, any ethnic group has a favored status in the eyes of God. That is patently unbiblical to go, your, the blood that flows through your veins, who you're related to, or your kind of ethno-political position gives you favored status in the eyes of God is a dangerous and false doctrine. But it is the predominant doctrine today. These detractors of which Jesus speaks, though they were ethnic Jews, right? They say they're Jews. According to Jesus, they're not Jews at all. They're not, he, he's going, look at it. They say they're Jews. They might have the blood of Abraham flowing through their veins, but they are not actually Jews. And this is something the whole New Testament teaches over and over, and yet at the same time, people are so confused. The Apostle Paul in Romans 2.29 says, But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men but from God. God is not a respecter of persons. God is not looking at what blood flows through your veins and goes, oh, well, we're related or something like that. It is always by promise. It is always by faith. I believe it should be the, the Christian conviction, especially, especially in the light of the fact that the Bible teaches that there will be Jews coming to faith, that we should love and evangelize Jewish people. That's, that's the way that relationship should go. We sh we, I mean, of course, we should be that way with everybody, right? But we are to love and evangelize. People ask me that a lot because they are like what I just told you right now. Um, people who are tuning into the radio may not tune in again. People who have come to our church were like, well, I, no, I've, I've been brought up in a religious culture that teaches that what you're saying, Pastor Paul, is wrong and you, you need to repent and I'm out of here. And what am I saying? I am saying that the Jews, like anybody else, need to be loved and evangelized. Well, I taught that in a conference we had here one time. And I remember after the conference, I was back in this hallway here, and some Christian brother, pretty big, scary-looking guy, came up to me and he put his finger right in my chest and he said, you better watch yourself. Because he understood the promise in Genesis 12, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you, as referring not to the covenant people of God or the church, but to Ethnic Jews are those with some type of ethno-political relationship with Israel. And the fact that I said, no, they need to be loved and evangelized. In his mind, I was kind of off the rails. Well, I'm willing to defend that position, and I think it is, that I think it is the position. Think about it this way. Would this man, who put his finger in my chest, have issued the same warning against Jesus, who so far from viewing this ethno-religious community as favored by God actually refers to them as a synagogue of Satan. What are you going to say to that? They are, they, are, they are being governed by the evil one. Now, before we move on, let's keep one thing in mind in light of this passage. Because you're going to see in our confession a reference to the synagogue of Satan, and I'm going to read it in just a second. In the same way that synagogues were made up of God's covenant people and then became synagogues of Satan. Churches, if they do not maintain their love and faithfulness, can become synagogues of Satan. That's the warning the Apostle Paul will give. He's like, don't get haughty. Don't get full of yourself because he'll regraft them in and he'll kick you out unless you maintain your faithfulness. We need to be aware of the fact that there's a direction churches take, and if you're going in the wrong way, that, the, that you end up in that last terminal at the synagogue of Satan. We read it in our confession. I think it said, well, 
the purest churches under heaven are subject both to mixture and error. And we all know that, right? I mean, we all recognize there's no perfect church. But some have so degenerated as to become no churches of Christ, but synagogues of Satan. Nevertheless, there shall always be a church on earth to worship God according to his will. I mean, you talk about move it, removing your lampstand, right? Remember we talked about that? Jesus said, I'm going to remove your lampstand. And that is on the road to becoming a synagogue of Satan. Verse 10, Jesus saying, Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. Well, I don't know, you might think that the first and the last, the one who is in control of human history, would simply deliver his people from peril, right? Wouldn't that be, I've often thought, you know, of that, you're you're looking at stories in the Bible, you know, the story of the the serpents that bite everybody in the Old Testament during the time of Moses, and uh, they're dying from the bite, and then God instructs Moses to build a bronze serpent, you know that story? And he's like, just look at, by the way, it's the serpent that doctors use now, you know. And all they have to do, you have to look at the, look at the bronze serpent, which is, we learn in the Gospels, is a type of Christ to be healed. Right? So there's this healing that comes. Like, I'm thinking, well, God, why don't you just get rid of the serpents? Right? He's like, I'm not getting rid of the serpents. Because I have a greater plan for you. My plan is for you to look to Christ. Because when you look to Christ, you're not just going to be healed from the serpent's bite. You're going to be healed from sin itself. You're not going to just be healed from the first death. You're going to be healed from the second death. So there's a bigger picture here. So we're looking at this kind of going, I'm reading this letter. I get this letter. I'm in Smyrna. And here's something that's undeniable. If you believe in Jesus as the prophet, that is, you're about to suffer. He's kind of going, you're about to suffer. That is just a very common practice of God in the scriptures, not to immediately deliver us from our suffering, but to see us through our suffering. Why would he do that? Well, the passage says that you might be tested. That you think, you know, we think of a test, you know, we might take in school, but I would more compare that to like the, the testing of a metal, right? The refining of a metal. He's refining us through suffering. The author of Hebrews says that Jesus was perfected through suffering. God is bringing us to a certain place, and the means by which he gets us there is through our suffering. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to to go through the suffering? Are you going, no, I've signed up for Christianity because I was told things would be easy. Well, Jesus is writing a letter saying you're about to suffer. Put it in the bulletin, right? Right? Whatever the difficulty was going to be, we read in this passage, it would last 10 days. You know, it's just kind of, I look at that and I'm thinking, well, it seems like an arbitrary number there, 10 days. But we see this also used elsewhere in Scripture in terms of a time of testing. Remember the story in Daniel where in the very first chapter of Daniel, he's there and he won't eat the king's food. And they're like, oh, no, we've got to keep you guys healthy. And he's like, oh, and here, you guys eat the king's food I will eat, you know, the ordained food for the Jew for how long? Ten days. And we'll see who looks better. And it was Daniel who looked better. So you see, at least in Scripture, one reference to ten days being a time where you're kind of being tested. But at very least, ten days is a short period of time. It's a brief trial, and Jesus is weighing this brief trial against the eternal crown of glory. And that measurement must ever kind of be in our minds, recognizing that the suffering of this age is not worthy to be compared to the glory that will be ours. We we must ever live our lives with a recognition of the eternal glory. Otherwise, we could be overwhelmed by the difficulties that we are going to suffer in this life. Friends, our very lives by biblical standards, are a hand breath. That's it. I mean, we are here and gone. I mean, talk about a vapor, right? And we need, you know, one of the great pastors in the past, uh, in history, you know, made the statement, I preach as a dying man to dying men. That's the message. 
the message is, really, the heart of the message is, death awaits. Have you embraced the life in Christ? That's the message. It's not just kind of like, hey, I can, you know, it's not your best life now, which is, by the way, a best-selling Christian book. I hope it's not. I hope this isn't my best life now. It's eternal life. Now, before we close, I think it might help us to recognize kind of the the machinations of Jesus' warning here. Like, how does this all unfold? What does this look like? Because he says the devil's going to throw you in prison. But that doesn't really happen, right? I mean, it's not like the devil kind of goes, hey, come on, right? Walks you into prison. So what does that look like? How does the devil actually achieve throwing these Christians into prison? Now, I've mentioned this many times, and so the things that I mention many times, I will eventually put in my little who's who and what's what in Revelation when I get to it. But there are two adversaries in the book of Revelation. There's the religious adversary of the church, which is Jerusalem, and the political adversary of the church, which is Rome. These are the two enemies that we're going to be kind of seeing God deal with. Well, the means by which this testing slash imprisonment takes place is by Satan winning the religious community, right? They become... The religious community becomes a synagogue of what? Satan. So Satan wins the religious community, and then the religious community influences the political community because the religious community can't put people in jail. It's the civil magistrate who can put people in jail. So understand the order. It goes from Satan to the religious community to the civil magistrate, to the civil authorities. That's the order that takes place. What happened to Polycarp was very similar to what happened to Jesus. Right? What, how, did, how did the crucifixion of Christ unfold? It begins with Satan, who enters Judas to betray him. And then it moves to the religious community, the Pharisees. And then the religious community convinces the civil authority, Pilate. That's the order. But let me just say this. I made a huge mistake, and hopefully some of you caught it, because it doesn't start with Satan. It starts with God. Because ultimately, as with the Apostle Paul's thorn in the flesh, it's God's own plan for the refinement of his own people. We, we, don't, we don't look at these as God and Satan as two deities warring against each other. The, the devil, Luther said, is God's devil. He's God's junkyard dog. And the crooked stick of Satan is something God will use to draw his own straight line. You know, the, the, God will accomplish through the sin of man his own divine purpose and plan. And this is something that Jesus needs to convey to this church. He's the first and the last. Satan's going to throw you into prison, but you need to understand that it is your kingdom that endures to the end. And I am your king, and I will deliver you. You know, we admire people who are faithful unto death. Jesus says, be faithful unto death. But I would argue that being faithful unto death must always ultimately be in the service of Christ. Whether I'm a police officer or in the military or a dad or whatever I am, that ultimately I need to recognize that if I'm going to give my life up, ultimately, even though it might be for my own children or my own country or my own what have you, ultimately is to the glory of Christ. We need to be willing to give this life up. But you never give up that second death. That that is not on the block. That is not something that we negotiate with. To die for a lesser God, I think, is tragic. Because there is a second death that Jesus refers to here that is much worse 
than the first death. You know, uh, if you read John Calvin on, you know, the passion of Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane when he's sweating the great drops of blood, Calvin says something that at first blush almost sounds so irreverent. He basically says that if what Jesus was, was going through in terms of take this cup from me and I'm sweating these great drops of blood, if what Jesus had in mind was the first death, if what Jesus had in mind was what the Romans were going to do to him, he would have been effeminate. And I'm like, wow, that seems like a dangerous thing to say. But his argument is this, he goes, because there were people who faced the cross of Rome with great courage. Are we going to assume that Jesus was not as courageous, you know, as Spartacus? No, no. What Calvin argues, and I agree with, is that it wasn't the first death that caused this consternation in the heart of Christ. It was the prospect of the second death. It wasn't the wrath of man that concerned Jesus. It was the wrath of God that concerned Jesus. We don't, wanna, we, we don't want to face that second death. That second death is faced for us by Christ. And I pray that's true of everybody in this room. Because the first, first death is nothing compared to the second death. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Well, at the very end here, I'm saying I, what's interesting in my research is that Smyrna, this church, this church that had no like, uh, critique by Christ other than a commendation, still stands. All indication is Smyrna, the church at Smyrna, though it's a very Muslim community, that church is still there. And so, you know, maybe that's a testimony to their faithfulness and God preserving them. But what we finish up here with is that the great promise to those who overcome, what does that mean? To persevere in the faith, even in the face of great devastations from the devil and humanity. Those who are going, look at, I'm going to run this race until God brings me home. Have the eternal deliverance over the second death. It is to vanquish that second death that Jesus went to the cross. It was to vanquish that second death that Jesus rose again. And I pray that we all know the power of that resurrection. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we do pray that we would ever seek to be a faithful church that we'd be willing to receive corrections and rebukes, that you would ever instruct us individually and corporately. We pray that anybody who would walk in to our church would come to know the light who is Christ, and that, Father, by your Spirit, you would bring them near. We pray that for all churches. We do pray that your kingdom would continue to advance and that all the kings of the earth would come before you. What a blessing, Father, that would be. And we pray for it in Jesus' name. Amen.
be seated, and if you'll prepare your communion elements, we'll participate in the Lord's Supper together. You know, as we read these seven letters to these seven churches, we see on the part of Christ a desire to strengthen His church. That's what He's doing. To Him who overcomes over and over, we hear that and we read that. But what Jesus provided when He knew that His earthly ministry was coming to an end was something that is designed to strengthen His church, and that is the Lord's Supper. I think it is a great neglected thing in the church today. It is something that God has ordained to grant you and me assurance that we, in fact, belong to Him. It's a way that we are strengthened. It's a way that uh, our faith is is buttressed. Yet at the same time, like so many things in the Bible, it is a very dangerous activity. We, We approach it so casually sometimes, and I think we need to be careful. The church at Corinth were partaking in an unworthy manner, and some of them were getting sick and dying. That's not not new. We see that in the Scriptures quite a bit. The Ark of the Covenant, it was a blessing to God's people, but it was not a blessing to the Philistines. They were kind of handling that which was holy to God in an unholy way, and they ended up with boils. The, The splitting of the Red Sea was a blessing to God's people, but it was not a blessing to the Egyptians. And the Lord's Supper, if taken in faith, is a blessing to God's people. But it is not a blessing to those who take in an unworthy manner. And what does it mean to take in an unworthy manner? Well, the church at Corinth, you know, they were taking it and getting drunk and disregarding one another. There were all sorts of things they were doing that kind of led the Apostle Paul to go, this, you, what you're doing isn't even the Lord's Supper. What you're doing here is a profaning of that which is holy. And you're suffering as a result of it. At very least, if you're not a believer and you take, Paul says, you're drinking judgment unto yourself. It's like you're toasting to your own damnation. Well, as a church, we don't want that to be the case with anybody. We don't want anybody drinking judgment unto themselves. But we're not given access to your heart. Like, I can't sit here and go, yes, no, yes, yes. You know, we don't have that. So how do we do? How do we kind of go, look, at? we want to make sure to the best of our ability that this is a blessing. We would say, first of all, examine yourself. Are you in the faith? Do you actually believe what these elements are pointing to? The broken body and shed blood of Christ. Not just did Jesus die, but did he die and rise again for you? And if your answer to that is yes, he did. If by faith that is what you believe, then I can declare to you what Scott declared at the beginning of the service, and that is your sins are washed away, right? Because it is by faith alone, in Christ alone, that we are justified before a holy God. But I can also say that according to the Scriptures, the very first thing you ought to do, if that is you, if you're saying yes, the very first thing you ought to do is be baptized as a sign of inclusion among the people of God, as a sign that your sins are in fact washed away. And you look at these letters to these seven churches, and they are letters to churches, to the church at Ephesus, to the church at Smyrna, to the church at Philadelphia, and so forth. There is a call in the Christian life to be part of the local visible church. And God has given the responsibility for the proper administration of his sacraments to the local church. You are to be part of the body of Christ. So we would say, if you believe and if you've been baptized and you're part of a Christian church. This is a meal for you to eat and recognize. And we don't believe this is, we don't believe it becomes the body and blood of Christ, but we don't believe that it's just a memorial either. Memorials don't make you sick and die, right? There's a spiritual presence of Christ in this meal that strengthens us. And it's an opportunity for you to take and eat and drink and think. Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me, and think about what Christ has done for you, and be blessed. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we do pray that you would consecrate these elements from a common use to a sacred use, and we do pray that as we take and eat and drink, we would know more fully the power of the resurrection, that we would know what has been done for us by the grace of God through the blood of Christ, our Savior. 
So, Father, we do pray that these would become vivid in our hearts, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Corinth, wrote this, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it. And he said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Take, drink. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray. Father, we so easily forget and we think of the many times in Scripture we are told to remember. Thank you, Father, for reminding us of what you have done for us, that you have not left us at the mercy of our own sin and death, that you've considered us. You put your mind and your heart toward us. You prepared a body for your Son to deliver us, and you've made us your own. And for this, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please rise for our closing hymn. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. Amen.
724. Patrick Parks. Hey, we are going live with our question and answer time. So everybody in the room, feel free to have a seat and consider what your questions might be. Those of you at home, uh, welcome. I'm Pastor Paul. This is Aaron Davies, um, our, uh, one of our deacons, but who's been nominated to be an elder, so he's going through that process. Um, if you have a question, the way we do this is we take a question from the room and then we take a question from online. We go back and forth. So if you're at home and you have a question, we got um, Stevie Ray Vaughan up yeah. there. Uh, go to branchofhope.org and then you can put your question in online and it'll show up here. We got a yeah. couple of questions already. Do we have any questions from in the room yet? All right, uh, Mr. Adrian, you have a question. Yes, sir. Thank you again for today. You're welcome. Really appreciated it. Um, are you willing to talk to us about the dangers of blaspheming against Christ's church? Since you kind of pointed Well, to it's that. in the text. Uh -huh. um, well, I mean, what do you want to know? Sort of like... How would we apply that? How would we take counsel to ourselves not to, you know, to, to prevent doing that? We would never want to be anywhere near that, right? We want to be very far away. Yeah. I think a lot of us, well, okay, I shouldn't say that. I pray a lot of us, uh, all of us, have a sound understanding of the dangers of blaspheming Christ himself. But there seems to be a disconnect, a disconnect when it comes to his body, his, his corporate body, his mystical body, the church. So yeah, the, and that's a very strong word, obvious. Yeah, obviously. So I was just wondering if, what practical guidance you could give us to keep us from that and speak against it when we hear it and things like that. Well, I mean, I think um, I think any time you open your mouth to say anything, especially if it's a critique, it needs to be well thought out. It needs to be prayerfully considered. You've got to examine if what you're about to say is accurate. Not only is it accurate, but is it profitable to bring it up? And is it profitable to bring it up in a certain environment? Because in one respect, to say nothing when something should be said is negligence, right? We are to expose deeds of darkness, and especially, I would say, in a religious environment. So now you've got that. But at the same time, it's easy for there to be a step taken that becomes very unhealthy, where you're just venting, or it's a personal issue, or what have you. Um, so I, I think a lot of it has to do with us doing our homework as to whether or not what we're saying is not only accurate, but profitable. And... Um, you know, ultimately, where this goes, where this went with Jesus and say Polycarp, and I, you know, I know Polycarp's not in the Bible, but nonetheless, is that the the far end of the spectrum is are lying accusations, where where you've just are basically kind of going, I am so against the church that I can justify lying about the church in order for the greater good to prevail. So it doesn't matter if what I'm saying is accurate or inaccurate. What matters is the church needs to come to an end. And if I need to lie in order to achieve that, so be it. And so uh, it becomes, you know, this reviling accusation rather than, you know, I mean, there's a place to be accused. I mean, there's a place that we need to recognize that if I'm behaving in such a way to warrant an accusation, that's part of biblical Christianity. So I would say, I mean, in short, the answer would be to examine whether or not what you're saying, what you're about to say is true, whether or not it's redemptive, uh, whether or not this is the proper environment to say it in, and so forth, rather than just kind of blurt things out. And I, I would kind of go down that road. Yeah, no, that's great. I, just a really quick clarification. Right. Would you regard a lying accusation and a railing accusation as roughly synonymous, or would 
a railing accusation be more roughly synonymous with a reviling accusation? Yeah, I think, um, I think you can be very um, calm in your lies. I think when I think of a, a railing or a reviling, I think of enthusiastic, aggressive, you know, um, where a lying accusation can just be subtly dangerous. You know, I'm not sure of it, how much I would parse. Yeah, parse too that strong out. of a distinction. Yeah, 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 no, I appreciate that. All right, and uh, just one word of encouragement. I always appreciate how you bring Polycarp to bear in a sermon. Yeah. So thank you for doing that. You're welcome. You're welcome. All right, Mr. Davies, what have we got here on the uh, magic square? <laughs> I need like a, a sound. Woo. Yes. But, you know, uh, Patrick Parks. Hi, uh, Patrick. I've been waiting for this series of sermons on the book of Revelation for some 20 years and grateful the time has finally come. I can second that. Been blessed by each one thus far, so thank you. Speaking of time, question, regarding the time indicators or prophetic texts such as the time is at hand, the day is near, and so on, ought one to conclude that in James 5, 7, and 9, where he writes, be patient, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming, and the judge is standing at the door, that these are also time indicators with a reference to the soon judgment and destruction of the temple in 70 AD. If I may, you finished your sermon, quote, interestingly enough, all indications are that the church in Smyrna stands to this day. Could you comment a bit more of this? Thank you, and may God richly bless you and Branch of Hope. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's a couple of things uh, saying there. You know, you, one of the difficulties we have in the time texts is is recognizing that there are two, um, well, many comings of Christ. Jesus says, I will come and remove your lampstand, and so forth. So there's all sorts of what we would call conditional comings of Christ, where he's coming in a providential way to do this or that. But when we're reading a lot of these time texts uh, in the New Testament, uh, there are two major events, I think, that are being addressed. One is the second coming, and the other one is the destruction of Jerusalem. And um, so you've got to kind of begin to study those passages in light of the fact that the coming, the destruction of the temple, which really marked the end of the Old Covenant, was a major cataclysmic event. I mean, it was a huge, we're, bit, we're talking about moving from, from B.C. to A.D. We're talking about the beginning of the New Covenant, this international promise, you know, that God had made. And so it's not a small thing that, you know, when the author of Hebrews says, and he uses the near demonstrative, when he says, in these last days, he has spoken to us through, through Jesus Christ. Anybody, re the natural reading of that is that they're in the last days of the old covenant, is the way I would read that. So you've got to kind of recognize that some passages will be talking about the, um, the imminent coming of Christ in terms of the destruction of the temple and the end of the Old Covenant. I think it's a hard argument to make that imminent, I-M-M, I-N-E-N-T, which means soon happening, was something that Jesus taught about the second coming. Because if that is, in fact, the case, then his teaching was false because he didn't come soon in terms of the second coming. Unless you're going to say, well, then, then you have to start playing games with what constitutes soon, which now makes those words mean nothing. Now, I think what most people, well, I don't know if most people think this way, in terms of not the soon coming of Christ, but the kind of any moment coming of Christ. And that is, I think it's fine to go, you know, Christ could come at any time, although at the same time, I do think the Bible is teaching certain things have to happen prior to the second coming, in short, the fulfilling of the Great Commission. Now, what does that look like, the fulfilling of the Great Commission? Well, I, don't, I can't draw, I can't say X number of percent, the, this percentage of people on the earth need to be saved before the Great Commission is, quote, fulfilled. But I will say this, that when you see things like um, in the last days there will be mockers and 
ear, want, people wanting to surround themselves with ear ticklers and stuff. That's Paul writing to Timothy in the second person singular, telling Timothy how to respond to people that he's going to have to deal with who do that. We push that to the end of the world, but that's Paul telling Timothy what to deal with. Now, can we learn from that? Yes. But in terms of the mystery of lawlessness that is already at work, and Paul saying, you know who's withholding it, they, they, they seem to, Paul seemed to be under the impression that this is already taking place. Now, uh, regarding Smyrna still standing, a number of the commentators that I have studied on this, you know, make that statement, you know, that Smyrna is still a church. And um, I did do some online search for that to go, okay, because that area, it's got a different name now, it's called Izmir or something like that, is highly um, Muslim. But there's no doubt that there is a Christian presence there to this day. Now, whether or not, and, and that, you know, I gave it about an hour, because I'm like, I, I just can't spend that much time. And, but these guys who've written books on it, they probably spent more than an hour uh, doing how much, you know, that kind of research. But the conclusion that they drew was that there's, there is still a church in Smyrna. And um, so to what extent it's that church meeting in that exact location? I mean, t 25 years ago, we were meeting down the street, but we're still the same church, you know, but we joined the OPC, but we weren't the OPC then, but we're still the same church. So it's hard for me to speak with any deep accuracy on that. Yes, uh, in the room, Arnold Stanton. Arnold? Hey, Pastor. Um, I caught up on, on the rerun, I guess, so to speak, of the... Uh, um, the seminar uh, conference on the, uh, what you call the optimistic eschatology, and by the way, everybody spoke well. Aaron did a great job, and Thank so and, uh, I look forward to um, hearing more talk of, that they talks. I guess they're going to give right uh, before they're um, um, well, gives me a chance to question you guys and really grilly, I guess, right? Um, right. So, but uh, you mean the potential elders? Potential elders. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, for sure. Be, so, yeah. So. Try to get you guys sweaty, sweating a little bit. But okay. Good. Um, okay. Well, I had a. I th I'm wondering if there's a misnomer in your little title, uh, optimistic eschatology, and I want to explain why I think that. Because I think you're comparing, basically, your post mill, partial preterist view with the pre mill view, futures. Right? Would you say that's kind of the general flavor, or is that too specific, of of what you're the because it's a comparison, right? Why it's optimistic, relatively speaking, right? Well, I, I can only speak for my talk, all right? And um, I thought it was important, at least in my talk, to try to express where all the negative eschatology was coming from. Right. So hence all the quotes from um, a lot of the mainly Dallas guys I guess this really addresses you primarily, yeah. I guess, in all fairness. But yeah. I think in general it would be a, a, a post-mill partial preterist view where I'm, I would argue that if you uh, – because we're in the midst of the millennium as far as you – know, from your version, right. whereas right. the pre-mill futurist it tends to be like we're like the equivalent to like maybe 40, 50 A.D. in your view, where it's, you're yeah. still looking to the Antichrist. What I'm saying is – if we were popped in, to, if you went to the future to our theoretical, I guess I'm saying because I'm a pre mill, to a, let's say pop us in the middle of the millennium, I would argue that's a much more optimistic view because we would not be expecting any persecution. We would expect Christ to conk somebody in the head with his rod of iron, literally or figuratively, instant justice. And I would argue that uh, the pre mill view, if, if you line it up as we're both in the millennium, and then also I think we went back to 40 AD or whatever you'd have the concern of like, okay, sure, certainly we would be witnessing to people, the, the kingdom of God would be growing, but at the same time, we have certain things that are gonna go bad because, hey, destruction of Jerusalem's coming for sure. You're not gonna have a repentance of the leadership. And you know what I'm saying? It's almost like, a, I would argue there's a pessimistic, would be a pessimistic attitude back then that's similar to maybe what's happening now. Granted, it could be arguable, it's a relative difference, but yeah. what do you think of, of that argument? Okay, well, let me, let me see if I can, first of all, hopefully I've understood what you're saying, 
and then let me see if I could um, kind of unpack this. There, there are passages in the Bible that really talk about things going bad, going south, right? Um, the premillennialist puts all of that uh, historically what, in terms of what they think is going to happen just prior to the second coming. All right? That's when the church is going to wax cold, the Antichrist is going to prevail, and all these horrible things are going to happen, and then it like maxes out in the Great Tribulation, but you know, depending on your tribulation view, the church is raptured, and they don't have to go through that. But you have things getting worse and worse and worse and worse based upon a futurist understanding of the Olivet Discourse and uh, the Revelation. That's where that's coming from. I would say that the, those devastating cataclysmic activities are all things that mark the end of the Old Covenant, not the end of human history. So now you're kind of going, all right, now we're getting to history. And you're kind of going, but you've got Jesus coming in and deposing kings in the premillennial view, because we all have this view, at least I did when I was a premillennialist, that the, that the millennium is like, Disneyland. I mean, it's this like amazing place where it's just, there's nothing is going wrong and it's just, you know, Jesus is here. Although you got to deal with the millennium that there's going to be an uprising of evil toward the end. So you've got glorified Christ living on the earth with some glorified saints who are with him, with others who are not glorified. People are having babies and then you have people with sin natures being born in this kind of bizarre amalgam of glory and non-glory all living together and they're sacrificing animals to Jesus in this rebuilt temple and what have you. All of that I have a difficult time kind of finding a biblical warrant for. But uh, in terms of this wonderful future, I think if we start examining the way it's taught both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, in terms of how that beautiful future is actually going to be achieved, it's not going to be achieved in a cataclysmic fashion. It is not Jesus coming and in the wink of an eye deposing all the kings of the earth or getting rid of all, the, all evil in the wink of an eye. When you read the Old Testament in Isaiah, it, talks, it compares it to a plant that grows. In Ezekiel, it compares it to a stream a small stream coming out of the temple that grows into an impassable deluge. In Daniel, it's compared to a rock that hits the image and then becomes a mountain and covers the whole earth. A mountain doesn't hit the image. A rock hits it and then becomes a mountain. Then you get into the New Testament and it's compared to a mustard seed. It's compared to leaven. All things that start small and then permeate. And I would say that that beautiful future... Um, is a result of the growth of the kingdom of God. Not, and it happens gradually. It doesn't happen cataclysmic, cataclysmically. And I think that all happens when we confuse the ending of the Old Covenant with the ending of history, because when history ends, the very next thing is glory. So that's going to be cataclysmic, right? When the final resurrection is going to be cataclysmic. So that's the way that all, I think, unfolds. All right. All right. We've got a few here. Thank, that's a good question, and I hope that I addressed your question because I, if I didn't, I spent a lot of time answering. <laughs> Carol H. Hey, Carol. Revelation two thirteen says, "I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is." She asks, "Where is Satan's throne today?" Yeah. Well, we will get to that right next time, right. Um, but. Um, <laughs> Today, I would say, you know, Satan's throne, first of all, I don't think he has actually a literal throne. Um, I think it is, and it is where the devil is heralded or has undue influence. I, I would say if you're part of a synagogue of Satan, then you can assume that it's in some way Satan has his throne in your church. Any more, any more in the room? room? Oh. 
Seth. going to be a full non sequitur, but this okay. was just uh, a subject of recent discussion that I had. Uh, concerning uh, proper instances and times for the administration of the Lord's Supper, especially uh, as you see it commonly nowadays in the wedding. In the what? Uh, in a wedding, okay. where it's not a church service and you still have uh, a minister administering it to uh, usually just the couple. Mm. Um, oh, in a wedding. Yeah, like oh, okay. in the uh, you know as part like you know yeah, they yeah. do the vows and then they take yeah, yeah, communion yeah, yeah. together and it's just the two of them. It's closed off from anybody else traditionally. Uh, uh, do you, thoughts on that? Because um, I, I had a, an interesting long discussion about the you know merits of that, the pros and cons, what yeah you know, was uh, admirable and not so admirable about, about that. Yeah, but um. I, that was just a recent discussion that I was having, and I was wondering about uh, yeah. your thoughts on that. I mean, you know, uh, having it closed, having the minister, having it not as part of uh, a church service you know, on a Sunday, um, but uh, just your general thoughts, please. Yeah, no, I, I definitely have thoughts on that, I, um, and, I'm, you know, and I want to speak charitably because I'm pretty sure you know, when I got married you know, 27 years ago, we did it at our wedding. And I know for sure that I have done it in weddings in the past, where I'm like the the couple. They want the very first thing to do as a married couple is the Lord's Supper, and so I, I don't want to. I'm saying that because I don't want anybody to feel like I'm being unduly critical. Um, I want to be charitable in my approach, because I don't. I won't do that anymore. Like I've changed my position on that for a number of reasons. Um, First of all, I do think that the Lord's Supper should be done at a called worship service and where the elders of the church are taking responsibility for the proper administration of the sacrament. So that's one thing. I think that it's not a one-man deal. I don't, I'm, I'm not the Pope. I don't decide we're going to do this or not do this. Our church is governed by a plurality of elders and it is the responsibility of the elders as a group. Because every time you see the word elder in the New Testament, other than about three times, it's always in the plural. It's the elders who take responsibility. So I think it should be in a called service. We're not Roman Catholics. We don't believe that the wedding is a, um, a sacrament. So the wedding would not be a called service. Um, so that's one reason. Another reason is... The, it, it misses the, one of the major points of communion, which is communion with God and with one another. So you basically, if you're go, even if you said, well, we're going to somehow make the wedding a called service, which has got its own problems because the wedding can't really be part of the liturgy, but let's just say we went by that. Now, you really need, when you fence the table, to exclude everybody in that service that wedding, who's not a Christian and a member of good standing of a Christian church. So it's not just the two of you, it's the whole church. Now at your wedding, you're going to leave a lot of people out. I mean, do you really want to do that in your wedding? Do you want to kind of excommunicate people in your wedding and so forth? So I think you've got problems there as well. It's, communion is not designed to be with two people. Now, there could be an exception to that, like we do communion if somebody's sick and they just can't make it to church. But you don't want to make the exception to the rule, and that's what you would be doing if you did that. So I think there are a couple of reasons, really a few reasons, why I arrived at a conclusion where I wouldn't do that anymore. And one is because nobody wants to fence the table at their wedding. Secondly, you're missing the point of it being a communion with God and one another, and doing it as a called service where the elders are taking responsibility for the actual administration of the sacrament. So there's all sorts of uh, difficulties, I think, if you want to go down that road. Good question. All right, back here. Mm -hmm. Ken Murray, in light of irresistible grace, how does one reconcile warnings like being grafted in and then cut out? or the language of perseverance that can be and misinterpreted as works-based salvation. Yeah. 
As a former Pentecostal, I struggled with these verses and ones like them for years. What does Paul mean when he says Jews can be grafted back in and others removed? Can someone lose their salvation or have their salvation removed from them? I know one can't, but how do I better understand this passage? Right. That's a really good question because people will kind of look at that, you know, where he's talking about Paul's kind of going, you know, if you don't continue in faithfulness, you could be excluded yeah. and he'll regraft them in. And people don't have a problem with the regrafting in as much as, okay, are you saying somebody who's actually regenerate is no longer regenerate? Well, first of all, I think when you run into a problem, when you kind of individualize a corporate message. I think Paul, in a way, he's talking about the church and he's talking about the Jews, not necessarily individual people. For example, when I, when I go look at our church could have its lampstand removed, our church could eventually become a synagogue of Satan. That's a direction that our church could take. That doesn't mean that a regenerate person, or say I'm, regener I'm actually saved, that doesn't mean I've lost my personal salvation. What it does mean is that I have allowed this church to go in a direction where it's no longer a church anymore. And so this idea that Paul's going, you know, you as the church, you can go in a direction where you're no longer a church anymore. So that's one way to handle that, where you're kind of going, is it corporate election or is it individual election? Because individual election, I think God chose individuals before the foundation of the earth to be his. But you also have corporate election, that God chose Israel. God chose the church. But not every Israelite was actually an Israelite, even in the Old Testament. And not every church member is actually a church member. Yeah. You know, so you've got to kind of recognize a corporate designation versus an individual designation. Now, let's take a step here to the warning passages. Now, but then you have these warning passages, right? A lot of them in Hebrews. It's kind of like, you know, if you continue, and if you don't, and if you continue, and if you don't, where you're kind of going, well, are you saying it's possible that I, as a regenerate person, I may not continue in the faith? Here's the way I think we need to understand those. The means by which God preserves us in the faith is through the warning passages. It's not as if he saves us and then kind of leaves us on our own and then later warns us and hopefully we'll have the intestinal fortitude and the wisdom to make the right decision. The means by which he preserves us is by ever warning us. So, so he calls us to faith, right? He goes, you know, believe. And then by the grace of God, we believe. And then he warns us to continue. Don't fall away. And I would argue by the same grace of God, he, he, he brings our hearts to heed the warning. If I, was in, if I was in my flesh, I wouldn't heed the warning. I would ignore the warning. But the means by which God preserves us in the faith is to continually warn us. To conti by the way, not only continually warn us, but continually preach the gospel to us. Like we need to continually hear the gospel. We need to continually recognize that we are called to persevere and so forth. But ultimately, the reason that we come to faith and stay in the faith is because of him who began a good work in us, completing that work. So I don't think there's a, um, a conflict there. It's just a matter of kind of working that out. It's a good question. All right, any questions in the room? Uh, Carrie. Carrie. Hi. Hi, baby. <laughs> so, unfortunately, this is my last Sunday here. No. <laughs> May it never be. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to have to um, give you a warning. <laughs> so I'll be going to Bonita OPC down in San Diego. Oh. Um, and Wait, who's the pastor there? Um, uh, pastor Joe, I can't pronounce his last name. It used to be Pastor Parker, but then he retired. Right, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Um, so I've been going to Bonita off and on for a while. Oh, yeah. I mean, obviously with Josiah being down there. Um, and they, do, they don't do communion every Sunday. I know that at our old church down in, or up in Washington, they did communion every Sunday. And then here yeah. it does communion every Sunday. And I know that in the Bible it says, um, like there's passages in some places, it slips, slips my mind up where, 
um, but it says like do this every time you gather as often as you gather right mm -hmm. yeah and, and so correct, like yeah. how would you are they not argue but I guess communicate to that to the church of like because they're not it's not obviously a money issue but it's more just like oh well we want it to be more special but it's like yeah. it should be special every Sunday every time you do it right all right so let me that's a great question and um, just so you know the, the construction, you know, of that in Corinthians where Paul says, for as often as you gather, it, it's not as ironclad as we would like it to read uh, in terms of weekly communion. I mean, I kind of read it that way. It seems to make sense. But there are ways of reading that that don't yield that conclusion. Just so you know that if you, if you get in that discussion with the pastor, if he's done his homework, he'll know that even though it seems to say that, there are ways to read it where it doesn't, okay? So just put that on the sideline. Now you get into, obviously it's not a money issue. It's not like they can't afford the wine and the, the bread. Um, the two biggest issues you're going to hear are um, a time issue because a lot of churches, when they do communion, there's a lot of pomp and circumstance to their communion service. When I was at a PC USA church before I came to Branch 35 years ago, they do it quarterly. And it was a big event. You know, they had all the elders up front, and they would have in special seats they would sit, and they would have this whole choreographed event. And it was, it was in a way, it was kind of cool because they made such a big deal out of it. But on that Sunday, the pastor gave a sermonette. Literally, it said, sermonette. And somebody one time said, well, sermonettes are for Christianettes. You know, I'm like, well, that's a good one. Yeah, so it's kind of funny. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, they'll be like, we, could, we couldn't do that every week because it just takes too much time, and every week we'd have a sermonette. And my response to that is, you don't have to have all the pomp and circumstance. Like our communion service, I think, takes us seven minutes. It doesn't take a lot of time. So you can make it quicker. The other question that comes up is what you said. It's just not, it's going to lose its specialness. And I remember thinking that, and I can't tell you how wrong that, that fear actually is. You, um, when you do communion every Sunday, it's so, it is so the opposite of you're going to make it meaningless. It actually is, you're telling your congregation, this is so important that it needs to be done every time we gather. Like they're, they're hearing, it's just the opposite message. And people in our church will recognize that on Sundays when we can't have communion for one, for one reason or another. That it doesn't seem like you've even gone to church. Like church didn't happen. We didn't have the Lord's Supper. So it's, it's just the opposite, I think. Um, it's, I think it's only, it only loses its... Um, unique sanction appeal if you're a church that doesn't really focus on what that message is. If your church revolves around the resurrection, the Lord's Supper will always be um, appreciated. So, but I would just say, you know, you might want to approach it gently and, you know, my, I remember sitting around with a bunch of pastors at, I think it was one night we all went out to dinner at a family camp, and it was just me and like 11 other pastors, and I was like, a couple of us do it, did it weekly, but most of them didn't, and I'm like, well, why, do you, why don't you guys do it every week? What's the deal? So I heard all those things, you know, and um, my final argument in that discussion was uh, really revolved around why wouldn't you do it every week? That was kind of where I ended up. I'm like, you know, if, if you can do it in seven minutes, and if it's, you know, because somebody said, well, is there a different kind of grace that comes through the Lord's Supper? And I'm like, as if it's not essential, because the grace of God is one kind of grace. I'm like, well, why do it ever, if that's your thinking, right? So it is definitely, it's definitely a different means by which God extends His grace. And uh, why wouldn't you do it? Like, yeah. are we really too busy on Sunday morning? to do the Lord's Supper. Like, I just feel like that. I feel like the argument has to be turned on its head uh, rather than 
me justify doing it every week, I want, you know, I'd hear the argument why you don't do it, you know, which I've never heard a good argument. But at the same time, you don't want to go there from Branch of Hope and become a troublemaker. <laughs> Carrie, just kidding. All right. All right. Um, another one online from a former member. Um, uh, is there a biblical aspect of worshiping uh, with songs with various instruments, or does it just have to resort to a piano? Also, I think there's nothing wrong with having lead singers, but as a church, aren't we supposed to sing with one another, rejoicing in the sounds of hearing one another sing? How can we do so when there are lead singers on stage and they're loud? They're so loud. Uh, okay, a couple of things. Yeah, I mean, there are numerous passages in the Bible um, where we see numerous kinds of instruments being used to worship God. I mean, just so you understand kind of the argument, I'm not sure to what extent this person, um, where they're at on this. There are, there are people who do not believe that the new covenant worship warrants instrumentation, just so you know. That they, and you'll, I've been to churches, and all they have is like one of those little tune, uh, those little things you blow that gets you on the right note, or those little pitch. No, not a tuning for it. It's a pitch something, a pi pitch pipe. Yeah, it's like, ee, and then you're like, now you're off on the right note. But I'm like, of well, course, you really shouldn't have a pitch pipe, right? Because that's kind of an instrument. And so, but they're trying to like, because they, they're like, instrumentation all revolved around the old covenant sacramental sacrificial system is kind of the argument. So they would play the drum as they would kill the lamb and so forth. And um, so that's, that's where the argument goes. I don't really buy the argument. I kind of feel like, you know, today we, were, we did a psalm today. And in the psalm, the psalm said, we're worshiping you with, and there was an instrument, harp or whatever. And I'm like, it seems to me to be a little counterintuitive to sing, because these are the same people who are psalm only people, right? I'm singing, I'm going to worship you with a harp while you don't have a harp, while you're in, in principle against having a harp. It doesn't, that just kind of doesn't compute for me. And I think that it's not as if the organ or the piano is the sacred instrument. I think once you open up instrumentation, you know, I mean, there were drums. And they were literally drums where you took an animal skin and peeled it over an opening and hit it with a stick and so forth. So forth. And so I, I think um, I am not, have not been won over by the argument that, number one, there should be no instrumentation. I've not been won over by the argument that you should only sing the Psalms. I mean, I appreciate their desire, but, you know, we read in Revelation, you're going to sing a new song, and you're really, I mean, there's, uh, in the same way that we recognize a sermon that is not infallible, we recognize that there are hymns that are not, that, that are not infallible and so forth. Uh, but to the other question about leaders, um, I don't know how loud the leaders sound. I mean, I, I'm not a good musical person, but you need a leader, um, and every church has one, just so you, whoever wrote that knows. Every church has somebody up front who's going to help us all start on the right word, on the right note. You. You, you've, and if you don't have somebody up front doing it, it's going to be somebody in the front row that you're going to look at and go, well, that guy's a good singer or she's a good singer, so I'm going to follow, because it's not me. And I'm kind of looking around going, okay, when do we start? You know. And so almost all churches, no matter how committed they are to the regulative, a tightness of, of this principle called the regulative principle, will have somebody up front who will do something like this. Right? And you start. And not only are they letting you know when to start, they're letting you know on what note to start. Now, we have told our worship leaders that, um, that once we, they get started, it's okay to back off away from the mic a little bit. But I, I being a not a musical person, I am somewhat dependent upon these people up here on these microphones, for me 
to know when to start singing not only the beginning of the song, but when to start singing the next stanza. Like, I, I'm not sure when to do that. And I'm not sure what note we're supposed to be on. So they're just kind of helping me. Now, I agree with the person who wrote this. I've been to churches where the people up front just take control. Yeah. Like, take control. I went to a church not too long ago. I was out of town. And I looked around the room and I realized if, if, if somebody pulled the plug right now, this would be dead silence because nobody was singing. Like there were like a big band and the people were up there and they were up there and they were, I mean, they were really talented and it was like a concert, but it was not conducive to everybody singing. It, they, I, people are there, they're watching, they were enjoying the talent, but it wasn't as if it was necessary for them to actually contribute, to make it the worship of the congregation. And I don't want to sound overly judgmental, but I know if I were the pastor of that church, I'd be very discouraged looking around going, nobody's singing. We're all just letting them do all the singing. And I would rather pull the plug and let us hear how bad we are in our worship yeah. than fantasize about this being a very vibrant worship service simply because We've got amplified sound and four or five talented people up front singing in such a way that it sounds good. I think that we are to, um, the worship primarily should be human voices and not, uh, and it should be corporate. Yeah, corporate human voices. And I am to be, if I'm reading Paul correctly, we are singing to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody in our heart. I'm to be ministered to by the sound of your voice. And you're to be ministered to by the sound of my voice. Like we're to have kind of, and I have to say, I feel that sometimes in our church. I feel like people are singing and I hear their voices and I'm encouraged by that. And there are times when I don't, where I'm like going, we could be a little bit more voluminous, right? A little more volume, you know, like let's, let's, I always think of Casablanca. I can't not think of... You guys ever watch Casablanca? Where they're in, you know, Rick's Cafe Americana, and they're singing, like, the, the German folk song, German national anthem, and the French start singing this French folk song. And it becomes a competition. It's like, you are not going to sing us out of our country. You know, and it, it's really a moving scene where you're kind of going... These people are singing a song of victory, and they're not going to be oppressed. Anyway, so that's hopefully I answer that question. Yes, Alan. As the guy who sets that level every Sunday morning, it, um, we don't turn it up louder if the congregation gets louder. So if you can still hear the lid singer. It just means you're not singing loud enough. Yeah. Wow. Oh. Okay. A, a gentle rebuke. Oh, sound man. Uh, all right, anybody else? In, uh, anybody, are we, Nothing more online. That didn't count. All right, Seth, round two. Can I go before Seth? Yet another. <laughs> He's messing with you, man. Uh, this is yet another non sequitur uh, about a, a conversation that I recently had with a, a fellow believer. Um, and uh, this is more of a question about where he would go to, to speak more on this topic and to a uh, to address it, uh, you know, more from a, a well-rounded, well-researched position, uh, we were discussing uh, uh, covenant children lost to miscarriage, uh, in contrast with children outside of the covenant lost to abortion. Um, and obviously, we can't know for certain their fates, but uh, it would. I mean, uh, whereas in that discussion, I was leaning toward uh, like 1 Corinthians 7, where it talks about uh, the children made holy through the faith of the believing parent. Yeah. Um, and I uh, was uh, called uh, a few uh, unpolite words for asserting that I didn't believe that uh, the second group was de facto saved because they had a pitiable end. Mm -hmm. um, and I was uh, just... Uh, 
where where would you go to to you know uh, bring you know a scriptural basis to this discussion? Because I mean, it's obviously a very sensitive, charged yeah. topic, and you want to approach it in a in a very nice you know way uh, while while still being uh, right as scripturally accurate as possible. Um, yeah. Where uh, would you uh, look to in scripture to, uh, to, to research that and be able to speak to that? More? Yeah, well, I think 1 Corinthians 7 is a valid place. You know, I mean, it doesn't say that children are regenerate, mm -hmm. but it does say they are holy and clean, which are words of inclusion, covenantal inclusion. Uh, Psalm 22, David says, you made me to trust in you at my mother's breast. We see, so, you know, before he was able to, assuming he was probably a baby, right? If he wasn't able to offer what we might consider to be a credible profession of faith. We see John the Baptist responding by the Holy Spirit while still in the womb of Elizabeth. So there's all sorts of indications, I think, in Scripture. David said that I'm not going, my son won't come to me, but I'll go to him. And there seemed to be some comfort that he had in knowing that um, they would be together. Uh, so I think there's biblical warrant to encourage believers that if they lose a baby, that um, as our confession says, elect infants dying in infancy are saved. Uh, we don't know who the elect are um, for sure with certainty. We can't know that about others. I don't know that about you. You don't know that about me, right? So even um, we, we suppose it, I suppose if you are a member in good standing of a Christian church and have a credible profession of faith, you're probably the elect, but I don't know for certain. So there is always going to be this level of uncertainty as human beings. It's just part of it. And um, as far as the unbeliever and their children, I wouldn't necessarily make the argument absolutely that they fall outside of being the elect. Um, our, our tertiary standards in our church, interestingly enough, I was rereading them, and it, was, it reconfirmed something that I've held to for a long time. Right now, I've been, I've, I do a lot of funerals, a lot of them, um, more than I care to remember. Right now, I have two coming up, one with Dennis Nielsen on Saturday, who, as far as I, as far as I can evaluate another human being being in right standing with God, I'm about as confident as I could possibly be that Dennis is now enjoying the presence of God. I've got another memorial I'm doing of a guy who killed himself, who actually said he was an atheist. And, um, but they, the family still wants me to do the memorial service because it's a local thing. But I never, and this is what I was talking about with our tertiary standards, you know, our book of uh, order, you know, and um, directory for public worship and stuff. I never assume that God absolutely did not save somebody prior to their dying, even somebody taking their own life. I'm not going to arrive at the conclusion that on their last breath that God didn't go, you know, I'm going to open your heart right now. I will not preach um, assuming that. I will not go so-and-so. I can't say about that guy what I'll say about Dennis with extreme confidence. But I won't, I also won't say so-and-so is burning in hell. I'm not, I mean, and it's not just because I don't want to ruffle feathers. It's because I just don't know. And I'm not going to assign that knowledge to myself. So I would probably go there also. I would say there's great confidence that people who have uh, covenantal standing with God can be very confident that their children are who die, probably, you know, at birth or before, are with Christ. I probably couldn't extend that same level of confidence, but I don't know. And I think sometimes you have to just leave those things to God. You can't kind of go look at, I'm going to state emphatically this. I do believe that God can save people um, any time after conception. And um, that's kind of where I would go in terms of my discussion. But I don't think, I think it was Billy Graham, I would not hold the view, and I think it's a dangerous view, that all the aborted babies are going to heaven. 
I think it's a really dangerous thing because then you're just like, well, we're just going to kill them and send them to heaven. But God is not giving us that unwarranted assurance. I think mm -hmm. we need to kind of be concerned about that mm -hmm. kind of thinking. Yeah, good question. Nobody else here? We're done? And that's it online. All right. Well, so ends another morning of lively discussion. Yes. Enjoy the remainder of your day. All right.